Hi, welcome to New Hope Community Church Online. The sermon you are about to hear was originally given by Pastor Chuck Wilson. New Hope Community Church, to know, to live, and to share Jesus Christ. The title is The Cure for the Curse. The Cure for the Curse, 2 Kings 2, 18 to 22. All right? And it's really about healing waters. And I was trying to think about... Something that, that I had a similar experience, and it reminded me when I was in Israel at the Dead Sea. Anybody ever been to the Dead Sea before? Yeah, lots of hands. Good, good, lots of hands. And and you know what? You can go swimming. I think you still can. I was there many years ago. You could swim in it. Can you still swim in the Dead Sea? Yeah, still can do it. So I remember when I was there, and the water is supposed to have this healing properties, this regenerative, regenerative power, makes you younger, right? And and I, people were taking the mud. You get that, that mud. There's a room with all the mud in it, and you put the mud on wherever you have pains. And I remember one woman put it on her elbow. She had arthritis. Then she went and dipped it in the water, you know. And so I'm like, if this really works, I'm going to do it. So I remember I took the mud and I, I did it head to toe. I just head to toe mud. I was covered with mud head to toe. I was a young man at the time. Everybody was very amused by me. So I had head to toe and then and then I uh, didn't wait in the water. I went floating in the water and I actually have pictures of it, of me floating and I have my hands out of the water, my legs are out of the water, my face is out of the water, we're all covered in mud, right? But the rest of me is floating because it's the Dead Sea. It's really, really salty, right? You can you can float. So it's 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 crazy. And and it must have worked because look at me now. I'm fifty eight but but I don't look a day over fifty seven, right? It it worked. It worked. It worked. Now, the secret to the Dead Sea's healing, maybe, the, the regenerative powers, right? Healing in the floating, definitely, is the salt. The salt content is so salty. Some of you might remember uh, Salt Lake City, back when it wasn't a, a dump. <laughs> so, but you could actually swim in it years and years ago. But anyway, we won't go there. Uh, the... The, the, it's the salt, it's the salt content. Now we're not sure if it really works as far as healing and regenerating and all that, but we're gonna see a story in the life of Elisha where the salt really does heal. It really does heal the water and everything around it. And remember this, in the Bible, salt is symbolic. It's symbolic for something spiritual as we're gonna see here. It's a very important spiritual symbolism with salt. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the worship. We thank you for your word now. We pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us through your word and touch our hearts and work in our hearts and move us forward in our faith. Wherever we're at, take that next step forward. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so review once again. We we finished the life of Elijah, who is a type of Jesus Christ. We now move to Elisha, who is a type of... The apostles and in us by extension, you know, the followers of Christ. And we saw right away that he crossed the Jordan River. If you weren't here last week, make sure you listen to it. Uh, the, it was about death of self, how to die to self, and it was all that picture. And then now we're going to look at the very first thing Elisha does after crossing the river, picture of salvation. After recrossing it, picture of death to self. We now come to the next story. And it's 2 Kings 2, 18 to 22. And it's behind me too, if you want to read along behind me or in your own Bibles, that's great. But starting with verse 18, when they returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, he said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? The many of the city said to Elisha, look, our Lord, this town is well situated, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Bring me a new bowl, he said, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt into it, saying, This is what the Lord says. I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained wholesome to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. So the starting point, very, very interesting. There's a lot here. Wait till you see. The starting point, where does this miracle happen? Jericho, right? Jericho, we talked a lot about Jericho. Jericho was right near the Jordan River. It was well situated. It was lush, right next to a river. The, 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 the dirt from the river flooding brought all that rich soil. It was just a, a wonderful, lush farmland, but it was not productive because it was cursed. 
It was cursed. Remember we went through in the book of Joshua? Joshua 6.26. Joshua said after they knocked down, after God knocked down the walls of Jericho, verse chapter 6.26, Joshua, at that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath, cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son will he lay its foundation. At the cost of his youngest will he set up its gates. And it stayed down for a long time until the time of King Ahab, remember the life of Elijah? Ahab, Ahab, that wicked king who led the people into the worship of Baal worship. And that's when the whole, that was when the, the, the land became corrupt and horrible. And this is what we're, Elijah, Elisha, it's this time. But listen to what happens in that time. First Kings 16 verse 34. In Ahab's time, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. Remember that line. In Ahab's time, Hile of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid his foundation at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sagub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. It was a cursed spot. A cursed spot. And, and it was rebuilt in a wicked time. And there are, there are lots of parallels to the USA today from that passage, aren't they? Aren't there? Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Parallels to the USA today. Now back to 2 Kings 2. Look at verse 19 though. It talks about what Jericho is like here. In verse 19 it says, The men of the city said to Elisha, Look our Lord, the town is well situated, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. The land is bad. Jericho was polluted. It was toxic. It was toxic. It says the water was bad. The Hebrew for that is ra, ra and it's a strong word in the Hebrew. We just we translate it bad, but in the Hebrew it's much stronger. It's usually translated evil or wicked. Evil or wicked. The water was evil or wicked. The land was also unproductive. The word be, means unproductive there means barren. Barren. Uh, it, it, the meaning of the, the root of the word is, is the mean, it means to cause to miscarry. To miscarry. The Jewish commentators see this and, and they, their comment on this is it says, they say it caused the trees to drop their fruit. It caused the cattle to cast their young. It, it caused the women to miscarry. It wasn't the women to miscarry. It wasn't just hurting the land and the crops. It was killing the people. Look at verse 21. Verse 21. I'll, I'll just read it for you. Uh, verse 21 where it says, Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. It wasn't just causing the land to be unproductive. It was causing death. It was toxic. It was pollution. It was, it was terrible. It reminds me, I was trying to think of what, uh, what this, what I could compare it to. And it reminded me of the Love Canal. Some of you remember the Love Canal? I remember it well. Because it happened in Niagara Falls, which was about a half an hour from my farm. We knew it really well, the Love Canal, when it blew up in 1978. Uh, I'll just read you a couple, some of you younger might not know this story. But, uh, this is by, Eckert Beck of the time of the Love Canal, I just saw some facts on it. The Love Canal is one of the most appalling environmental tragedies in American history. It was originally meant to be a dream community started by William Love. That's where I got the name from, Love. Uh, early 1900s, he started digging a short canal from the upper and lower Niagara River, and it was going to bring the water through this canal and generate electricity and build a dream community, like a utopia almost. And the, 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 it would generate the electricity and, and create this dream uh, community. But it, he ran out of money, and, and he couldn't keep it going, and so he just left this ditch. He got it partly done and just left this big ditch right there in Niagara Falls. By the uh, 1920s, the canal had been turned, the uh, municipal and industrial groups had used it as a chemical dump site. Started dumping chemicals, and this was back when... You know, industry and nobody knew what they were doing and just dumping, 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 right? Uh, it was pretty bad. Even I remember as a kid, even the, the effects of all the dumping. I grew up near Lake Ontario, right on Lake Ontario, and there were no fish in Lake Ontario. Not a fish. No fish. 
It was like you couldn't catch a fish anywhere. Uh, now it's loaded with fish because it, they started cleaning it up, cleaning it up, and it started uh, cleaning itself up then, and then all of a sudden there were fish, lots of fish. And all of a sudden you could eat one fish a month. <laughs> That's why you're allowed to eat. You know, because of the chemicals. Then it was one a week. And now you can eat all you want. There's fish everywhere. They come up. Our farm, we never had fish coming up. Now there's salmon coming up and all kinds of, of uh, fish coming up the creek to spawn and everything. They're everywhere. It's crazy. Giant fish coming up the creek, uh, up, up right through our farm from the lake because it, 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 it cleaned up. But at this time, it was all pollution, pollution, pollution. And so what happened is the chemical company in 1953 that owned it, that was doing the dumping, they just covered it with earth and sold it to the, the, the Niagara Falls, the, 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 the town, for a dollar. And then the town said, wow, we have this beautiful little spot, look at how smooth it is. They said, let's put a school there. And let's put homes there. And they built hundreds of homes and school and it all right on the site. And, and everything was fine until 1977. Do you know anybody know what happened in 1977? The blizzard of 77. I remember it very well. Oh, wow. I was, uh, like, I think a sophomore in high school. And I'll never forget, I was getting off the bus one day. I was getting off the bus, and the, from the bus to my house was about 100 feet. And I got about halfway there, and also I couldn't see the house anymore. A blizzard blew in, literally blew in. They could not get kids home. They had to bring them home over the next week or two on snowmobiles. It just whoosh, came swooshing in, huge blizzard, huge blizzard. Uh, we, we had two weeks off from school. They find, and that takes a lot. You have to have at least a foot where we come from to even get a day off. Anything less than a foot, they don't give you anything off because it's snow belt, right? Uh, and so we had two weeks off. We went back for one more week and it hit again and we got two more weeks off. We had a month off, all right? And it was Unbelievable. I wish I was stuck at school. There was, I was digging cows out, you know, bringing food in, taking manure out. It was, we literally, we would go walk outside and we walk up the snowbank up over our house and down over our house, right down the slope. Walked up over the barn, down. There was, there was, they were, they were telling all the kids, don't sled up by the telephone wires, the electrical wires. The drifts were everywhere. It was crazy. The snow didn't melt till June. It was just, it was so crazy there. But all that snow melted, melted. And it kept melting and it brought the water tables up. And what happened is it began to leach in Love Canal. All those toxins were finally brought back up to the top. The trees and gardens were turning black and dying. The swimming pools were, they would go out to, to see their swimming pool and it would be all this toxic bubbling stuff in their pools. There were puddles everywhere on, 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 in the, the school grounds and people's basements and, and everywhere with this toxic pollution. The kids would go out to play and they'd come back in and they'd, their faces and hands were burnt from the, the, the toxins. It stunk terribly. It was just a, a terrible thing. And then the birth defects started popping up. And the miscarriages started increasing. And it was just a terrible, terrible time. Finally, 1978, it got so bad that the governor said, we're going to buy all these properties back. And the President Carter, remember him, uh, declared a state of emergency there. And, and then they tried to clean it up. It took him years and years. Who knows if they've ever really cleaned it up. It was horrible. Horrible, toxic pollution in the Love Canal. The best thing I could think of locally is Willow Grove. What happened at Willow Grove? The military base and all the wells are contaminated and people are panicking about that. And, and all that's going on with Willow Grove. You see that in the news all the time now. But, but this, this is what it was like in Jericho. It looked good, but it was killing them. It was toxic. It was polluting. It also reminds me of the United States today, and spiritual pollution. Now, don't forget, the Old Testament is a physical picture of a spiritual reality, which we find in the New Testament. It's all connected. So what we see happening in the Old Testament with this is a picture of spiritual pollution, of spiritual pollution. The toxic pollution is a picture of spiritual pollution, which we see in the United States today. This great country, this beautiful country, this awesome, lush, wonderful country is spiritually polluted. 
We have, built, we have rebuilt many wicked Jerichos that many years ago were, were knocked down. We have rebuilt many wicked Jerichos and we're suffering the toxic effects today. Re- watch the news. Read the news. It's not hard to connect these dots, is it? Now hold that thought because we're going to come back to that. But first I want to look at Elisha's cure. Elisha's cure. And the cure is in verses 20 to 22. He says, bring me a new bowl, he said. And put salt in it, so they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt into it, saying, This is what the Lord says, I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive, and the water has remained wholesome to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. The cure, he uses salt. Salt is nature's ultimate purifier. Ultimate purifier. And it's also symbolic in God's word. It's symbolic in God's word for spiritual purification. Spiritual purification. And in this this age of apostasy that Elisha was living in, it was an apostate time, turned away from the one true God, Jehovah. God uses Elisha and salt to show that he is still working his mercy and grace. Still working his mercy and grace. It's no accident that Elisha is led by God to do this miracle of salt purification. Now the salt was just symbolic. had nothing to do with it. It was a miracle. But God told him to use salt symbolically to show the point of the miracle, what he's accomplishing here. It's no accident that he used Elisha. Because Elisha is a picture of the apostles. He's a picture of the apostles. He's a type of the apostles and by extension a picture of us, each one of us, right? This is a prophetic picture of what our job is, what we're expected to do. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 5.13. In Matthew 5.13 he says, You are the salt of the earth. That's where it comes from, salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the salt of the earth. This this is, we, we are the salt of the earth. What does salt do? What's the main thing we think of salt? Preserving, right? Preserving. There's a couple things. What are some things to do? We'll get to all of them. Seasoning. Healing, yes, thank you. Preserving, all these types of things. We're going to get to each one of these as we go here. But the, one of the main things in this time was, it, was a, it preserved. There were no refrigerators in Elisha's day, right? There was not much ice around. It, it, and it, they needed salt to keep the food from rotting. It would slow the decay. And that is Elisha and our job. We are the salt of the earth. It's our job in the USA today. There's no doubt this country is rotting with wickedness and evil. Think about what it was like the USA when you were a kid and what it's like now. It's shocking. It's like a horror movie, right? What is happening? It's, it's beyond comprehension. The greatest generation, would they even have got over and fought in that war if they knew what we were going to do, where we were going to head, right? World War II? But, but, but we... And knowing that, we should be slowing it down, reversing it even, as Christians, reversing the curse. Very important. The second thing I heard someone say is it seasons, it flavors, salt flavors. It brings out the full flavor. Something that just tastes okay, you put salt on it, wow. You know, it really brings it out. It's awesome. It makes food taste the best that it can. And that is our job. We're to show everybody how good life can be. How good life can be. What it should be like. How to live an abundant, full life in Jesus Christ. That's our job, to show them how, what an abundant life looks like. Very, very important. It also creates a thirst. Uh-uh, can you tell where I'm going with this one? It creates, th- salt creates a thirst. What was that commercial years ago? There, the guy is crawling through the desert and he gets there and he's saltine, saltines, and he chews the saltines and then, then he was trying to build his thirst for, what was the drink? I can't remember. Seven up maybe, something. There was a, some drink it was trying to get you excited about. That, that's, but that's what it should do. It should create a thirst 
It, it should create a thirst. That's what we should do. They, they, people should want what we, our lives should cause people to want what we have, which is a relationship with God. That's what our lives should do. When they see how we're blessed, not that we're perfect people, <laughs> but they should see a difference. They should see a difference in our marriage, in our family, in our work, in our health, because we treat our bodies like a temple of the Holy Spirit. And once again, we're not perfect, but they should see a difference. They, it, it, it creates a thirst. It, they, we're not perfect people, and we don't live perfect lives. We don't have perfect lives. There's still plenty of trials, but even then... They can see how we handle those trials, how we overcome by faith, by faith, how we overcome. They see the supernatural peace and joy and in the midst of, of what we're going through, in the midst of something that we're going through that would destroy them, completely destroy them. But they see us not only surviving, but thriving and, and having peace and joy. And they see that. It creates a thirst. They want it. They don't understand it, but they want it. They're thirsty for it. It's really, what I, I was thinking about this, it's like show and tell. Remember when your kids show and tell? Do they even have that anymore? You'd bring something in and you'd show it and tell it. And this is spiritual show and tell. Our lives should be spiritual show. We're showing people Jesus in our life. And then when people say, well, how are you doing this? You know, the, the door cracks open and we're ready. We're ready to tell. We're ready to, to share the gospel, to talk about Jesus Christ and our faith in him and how they can have that same Jesus by faith. Show and tell. Salt also, well, it creates a thirst, but I'm going to give you a negative part of it here now. If our salt loses its saltiness, we're going to get to the healing in a little bit in a minute. But if our salt loses its saltiness, it's no longer preserving, it's no longer flavoring, it's no longer creating a thirst. If it loses its saltiness, Jesus said it's worthless to God and men. We're, we're worthless then. If we become like the world, if we lose our impact, if we have the same worldview as everybody around us, right? If we have the same uh, beliefs, the same thoughts, we act the same way. If we, we become like the world, we, we're, we're worthless to God. We're no longer salt. We're worthless. We're worthless to, to our purpose. And I see this happening so much in our culture today, in, in the USA, in, in where we talked about the persecution earlier and where, where we have a ministry. Those Christians, they stand out. They're dying for their faith. But here, it's, the attack isn't persecution. It's making us comfortable. It's getting us, the Satan tries to make us like every, like the world. That's our temptation here. A lot of Christians come from these other countries and they get to the USA and they said, we would prefer the persecution. We did better spiritually there. Christians here are dead spiritually. You're too comfortable. You're just like the world here. You've been sucked into the world. We prefer living where we were going to have our heads chopped off. At least we, we were living it there. And, and that's the danger. We become just like the world. And the way it happens is we become desensitized to the beliefs and the thoughts and the attitudes and the media lies and all the things that are, are pushed down our throats. And when I, I have uh, something called pigmentary glaucoma had it for a long, long time. It's not regular glaucoma, but it's pressure, and it's because I'm very nearsighted, and the pigment wears off and clogs up my screens and my eyes. And, and so they have to, I have to, sometimes I have to get zapped, but, but I'm also getting my, uh, my cataracts done in May. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, but also, they have to give me drops to keep the pressure down. And I have to go in about every few months, and they check my pressure, make sure it's not too high. And I'll never forget the first time I went in. I went in, they gave me some eye drops, and uh, then they, then they, I saw, say, they go, open your eyes wide. And they said, okay, your eyes are fine. I go, well, how do you know? They go, well, we just put the lens up against your eye. I go, what? They, they, after these drops, they actually can put this lens right in my eye. And you don't even know it's there, sitting on the eyeball. They could stick their finger in my eye. They could stick anything in my eye. I wouldn't feel it anymore. And that is what has happened to the church in America today, the followers of Jesus Christ today. We have become desensitized. We have become desensitized by what we see on our TV or on our phones or on our computers or, or what people are saying to us in our schools. It doesn't even affect us anymore. We become desensitized instead of heartbroken. And we, be, we become like the world. That's what Romans 12, 2 is talking about when it says... 
Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Don't be conformed any longer. The, the, the word conformed there in the Greek means to be squeezed into a mold. It's like you take with Play-Doh and you squeeze it into the Play-Doh mold or clay mold. Don't be squeezed anymore into the pattern of this world, but be transformed. The word for transformed is, some of you know this one, metamorphe, metamorphosis. It's the same exact word. What happens to the, the, the caterpillar becomes this beautiful butterfly. The worm turns into something that beautiful that can fly. That's what we're to do. We're to go from that, that worm and to, to, to uh, uh, someone who can fly like the angels. You know? We're spiritually, we, we take off. We can soar on wings like eagles. We can do that because we've been allowed the word to transform us, renewed by the Transformed by the renewing of our mind through God's word, renews the mind. Very, very important. Are we conformers or transformers? We live in an increasingly toxic culture. It's shocking, isn't it really? Shocking. What more can they come up with? What? It's scary, isn't it? It's shocking, but it's here. We live here. We are called to be salt Here in the USA today, it's right here. How is God calling us to preserve? How is he calling us to purify? In our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, in the USA today. How is he calling us to do that? We're also called to heal. Someone brought out salt is healing. It's here that we're called to bring healing. Salt heals. It heals. If you've ever had a cut and you jump into the ocean to go swimming, what happens? Ah, ah, ooh, ah, right? I remember when I was at the, the Dead Sea and I put all that mud on. Everywhere. And that day I made the mistake of shaving. And, and I have sensitive skin, so I shaved and I bleed and I get, open all those pores up. Hey, you know what I'm talking about. You, you put on the shaving, I don't put that stuff on, but, but if you do it, it like burns. Well, that's nothing compared to this mud from the Dead Sea. I put it on and I was like... It burns, it burns, you know, I'm melting. You know, it was horrible, you know. It was like, it was crazy. So I took the salt water and I'm wiping it off and it made it worse, you know. That was burning, burning. And uh, I know what they felt like, love canal now. But anyway, the, the, it, was, it was bad, but it burns. But what was it really doing? Healing. And that's our job. We are to, to bring healing. But you know what? While we're bringing healing, it's going to burn. It's going to burn. People are going to be burned up. It's going to be hard for them to hear the truth at first, right? Some of you here, I remember having talks with you. You didn't want to hear it. And now you've been transformed by God's word. And that's what it does. It, it burns. But, but it, that's why we have to speak the truth in love. Remember, we keep talking about that. Speak the truth in in love, vital. Uh, you're talking to a friend. I, I talked to a friend, and we're talking, and they're talking about the pornography they watch. And I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't watch pornography. I don't look at it, you know. What? You don't? Because, you know, most 90%, whatever, you know. And I'm like, no, no, because I know it's really demeaning to women, and it hurts women in the long run because men mistreat them, and it also just hurts the marriage. It, it, it subtracts from the marriage. It, it ruins it. It's destructive. They're like, you know, a little ticked off at me at first, you know, and, and then well, I keep, we keep it going. And, and over time, they're like, they're thinking. It burns. But then as they start to see the truth of it, it heals. And that's just one example. Think of all the things that we're, we are, that we're to bring healing to. Think about that. Uh, the, the, the burning brings the healing. But we must speak the truth in love. Even though we know it's going to burn and they're going to be a little ticked off and they might... Yeah, yeah, but speak the truth in love. It's their only chance. Understand something. It's their only chance. They are living in the love canal. They are spiritually, emotionally dying. Inch by inch, breath by breath. It stunk at love canal. If you visit, it stunk. It was way worse than a farm. It stunk. And, and that's where they're living. They're breathing this foul lying air all around them. They are living self-destructive lives. Think about how we lived before Jesus. Think about how we would be living without Jesus, right? 
They're living that life. There's no hope. There's no joy. There's no meaning. No wonder they're trying to numb themselves. No wonder they're self-medicating on everything from A to Z. No wonder. Because they have no hope. But we have the cure. We have the cure for the curse. We have the hope. We have it. Jesus gave it to us. Matthew 5, 13. He says, You are the salt of the earth. Verse 14. You are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We Got to say it with me. I Raise your right hand. I am the salt of the earth. I am the light of the world. You gotta, you gotta believe it. I mean, it's, that's who we are. And, and every time you use salt, I know we're told not to use it much, but I, but some of us still use it now and, now and every other meal. But anyway, we use it all. It, every time you use salt, remember, I am the salt. I am the salt of the earth. Every time you turn the light switch, they don't tell us we can't do that yet, but every time you turn, well, some of us, well, we won't go into that. No, we're not going into that, but using electricity. But anyway, uh, every time you use the, turn on the lights, I am the light of the world. Remember it. Turn on that light. That's what I'm supposed to be doing in a dark world. Using that salt. That's who I'm supposed to be. That, that's who we, that's who we are. That's what God has called me to do be and to do. And our life should be that. Our lives should create thirst, should want to cause people to want what we have, should flavor, should show people what, how life is meant to be lived in victory. We should be showing people how to live in victory in Jesus Christ. They should see that victory in our life, no matter what happens, no matter what we have or don't have. It shouldn't matter. They should still see God's, res- Jesus resurrection power in our life. Remember I talked about that last week, dying to self so you can have resurrection power. Who is God calling you to bring Jesus Christ to? Who is he calling us to bring Christ to? Where is he calling us to be salt and light? Starting place, right where you are. Right where you live, right where you work, right where we go to school, our neighborhood, right where we are. And maybe you're here today, and while we're all praying about that, thinking about how God is calling us to be salt and light, maybe you're here today and you realize that you are living without hope. That you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ. You know all about him, but you've never put your faith in him. You're the one living without hope. Maybe you realize, maybe you're hearing this in your car on the, on the podcast, you're hearing this, that you are still stuck in toxic slime and sludge of sin and shame. Stuck in it. You're like the residents of Jericho. You are still under the curse of sin and death. We all start there. And you realize you are still there, but you can break free today. You can break that curse right now because Jesus has already broken it for us. It's been broken. We can be, we can claim that victory by Galatians 3, Galatians 3 verse 13. And listen to this one. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hung, is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Jesus Christ broke the curse He took the curse on himself when he died on that cross in our place and he proved it by coming back from the dead, proved that he took the curse and wiped it out by his resurrection power. And we can have that broken in our life by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, putting our faith in his death for us, putting our faith in his resurrection for us by putting our trust in Jesus Christ. That's what John 3, 16 is all about. You know, I never finish a service without it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Have you ever put your faith in Jesus? The word believe there doesn't mean in the head. It means in the heart. 
It's a deeper word than, it means to know something, but then to put your heart trust. It's a much deeper word in the Greek. It means to cling to, to put your complete trust in. Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. As we go to this time of prayer, responding to God's word, as always, we always have a prayer team up in the front corner there. After the service, I'll be up in the other corner. There's always someone here to pray during the prayer, during the worship. After the service is over and everybody's leaving, we're there. We're, we're there to pray. Anybody needs time to pray, we'll stay as long as it takes. We're here. But how, as we go to this time of prayer, how is God speaking to us? Maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus. You know that you realize that you are living in Jericho in the love canal spiritually. But for the first time, you really understand that that curse can be broken. You have a cure for the curse, and that is Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You can have that life right now. A simple Prayer of faith. God, I don't want the the garbage anymore. I don't want the toxic pollution. I don't want the sin anymore. I don't want my old life anymore. I walk away. I repent of that. I give my life to you, God. Like my faith in your son, Jesus, who died for me to pay for my sin, to take the curse. I put my faith in Jesus as my cure. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, or if you do pray that prayer of faith, something amazing, supernatural, life-changing, eternity-changing has happened to you. It's like the beginning of after of, 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 of an earthquake. You're just feeling a little rumbling, but believe me, it's life-changing. The Holy Spirit is in you. Your life will never be the same. You'll have a purpose and a joy and a peace and a power that you never dreamed possible. I want to encourage you, if you've taken that step of faith today, to let somebody know. You can tell me on the way out. Send me a text or call me, email me. You can, maybe you're here with a friend or a family member. Tell somebody today. Let somebody know today. Because we're going to be so excited for you and encourage you and your new life in Christ. For the rest of us who've already put our faith in Christ, how is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? How is he calling us to be salt and light? How is he calling us to purify and to preserve? Maybe we've become lose, lost our saltiness and there needs to be a repentance and a returning and a purifying again so that we can fulfill God's purpose for our life. Maybe we become like the world in some way, bought the lies of the world, the attitudes, eaten their garbage. And we need to go before God and, and say, God, I want to be salt. I want to be light. Maybe, maybe he's putting in our heart to preserve, our, be preserving or pure in some way, to make an impact here in the USA today some way. To flavor, to create a thirst, to bring healing. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would take your word and would convict our hearts. And it wouldn't be something we just 
walk out and forget about, but it would be something that burns deeply. Like that salt that burns, that would burn deeply and bring real healing to our hearts and all those that you bring us into contact with. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.